In today's video, I'm going to be talking about the JOR code. I'm going to show you nine quick and easy things that you should and shouldn't do in your public announcement to stay compliant with the JOR code. In this short video, I'm not going to go into the nitty gritty of the JORC, the history and the rationale, and I will leave some of the extended issues for perhaps another video. I'll also work to post a separate video on JORC Table 1 issues when I get some time. And if you have any questions or comments, leave them in the comment section below and I will answer them or dedicate a video to them if they raise things that are interesting or educational to discuss. My intention is to also post other videos on a range of different subjects, ranging from the technical to the conversational. So watch my LinkedIn post or simply subscribe to my YouTube channel. I'm very excited about trying my hand at these videos. I hope they are a bit easier to access and digest than some of the papers and written blogs I've produced on these subjects. Now, the JORC is not the most exciting subject to choose for my first video, but I decided to pick this subject as there are a lot of easy wins to be had here. So before I go any further, I want to just acknowledge all those who hate and all those who love the code. I talk to a lot of clients who find it the most useless bit of, bit of paperwork in the industry, written by consultants to benefit consultants. And I speak with others who are passionate as to its use and effectiveness to bring transparency to the marketplace. Its use and misuse has led to the demise of careers and I don't think the debate is going to go away anytime soon. There's certainly something to say for the fact that you get what's coming to you if you don't take the time to proper inform yourself as an investor. But it isn't always that easy. Those who are out there to intentionally mislead need some sort of disciplinary system, as investors will not always be able to determine whether information is misleading. My take is that once you decide to have rules, you need to make them clear and we need to stick to them, otherwise it doesn't work. That surely isn't too hard to see or disagree with. In many ways, an analogy with road rules is not too strange to make. Somehow, we are forced to cater for the weakest links in the reporting community. And yes, that does sometimes catch out those who mean no harm. I respect the fact that junior companies need to try and stand out from the rest and marketing isn't easy. More and more rules make this harder to do and this has been especially evident from the discussion on the announcement of scoping studies in the last two years. So in running through these nine points, I want to make clear that most of these issues are unlikely to mislead investors. They are simply there because of a lack of education and an understanding of the code. Most of the time, those issues are interpreted as trivial. Sometimes they are due to laziness. Do I really have to fill out this table one? But more often than you may realize, small but subtle things are omitted because they make things look less spectacular than what they really are. So think about metal equivalents, averaging of drill hole intercepts or choice of sections, true widths and a whole raft of other things. And yes, folks, even though some may interpret these things as slightly gray rather than black and white, you just shouldn't be doing things like that. I will at some point also do some case studies of some reports to make some of these points clearer. Uh, but that's always difficult as I don't want my bony ass sued. So we'll see how we go there. OK, so on with the list. Let's start with number one. Companies that announce they have completed a JORC compliant resource. Now, I really discourage my clients from using this terminology. Now, I get what the competent person was probably trying to say here, which is that the mineral resource has been reported in accordance with the JOR code and estimated or based on documentation prepared by a competent person as defined by the JOR code. But it is clear from reviewing a lot of these occurrences that quite often the JORC brand is being intentionally invoked here to somehow make the mineral resource estimate itself look really good. This is often written by the company's spin doctors or the managing directors, and the competent person hasn't actually seen the final version of the announcement. 
more on that later. But as the code says in clause six, the JOR code is a code for public reporting, not a code that regulates the manner in which a competent person estimates the mineral resources or ore reserves. The term JORC compliant therefore refers to the manner of reporting, not to the estimates. So why get worked up about this one? Well, for me, it demonstrates a misunderstanding of the code and it shows that people just don't know what they need to to report resources. Nine out of 10 times, once you see this, there are going to be other compliance issues as well. Okay, true, if it is reported under JORC, then it has been done by a competent person. So that in itself lends credibility to the quality of the work that has been done. But there is a sliding scale in this. I've seen reports where JORC drilling has been announced and even instances where JORC has been linked to particular work practices, such as the insertion of standards and blanks, like standards and blanks were inserted to comply with the JORC code. So regardless of your most likely proper intentions, don't invoke the JORC as a brand context to lend your resource announcement more credibility as it just demonstrates a misunderstanding of the code. Following directly from this point, I just want to talk about the JORC police. This is more a conceptual thing for me that shines through things like the JORC Table 1 and often from comments made within the reports themselves. Again, it comes down to a misconception as to what the code is here to do. As I mentioned in this point, the code is not here to regulate how you estimate a mineral resource. There are lots of practitioners who, just judging by the language they use in their reports, make it sound that if they don't insert standards, duplicates and blanks into the sample stream, that somehow the JORC police is going to bust down the doors and kidnap their babies. The JORC doesn't care about whether you do or whether you don't insert these things, it just wants you to report it in a transparent and material manner. For example, the same principle applies to the reporting of PXRF results. All the codes want you to do is be transparent as to the nature of the results and not misrepresent them as high confident results. So if you are reporting high grade cobalt results from the new Vanta unit you just bought without explaining relevant things such as uh, peak overlaps of cobalt with iron, then you're not being transparent and in breach of the code, even though you've diligently inserted these magical things called standards. So in short, don't use any wording linking any practices to the JORG label. Remember, it's a reporting code. Now I've got more to say in the travesty in our industry of the misuse of QA and QC terms and practices and the bad practices around standards, blanks and duplicates in general. The reason of insertion very often seems to be simply to satisfy the JORC, but frequently the results are either not analyzed at all, or when they are analyzed, almost always incorrect conclusions are drawn. So in my view, an absolute complete waste of your shareholders' money, but that will have to be another video. So let's get to point number two, proper reporting of expiration results. When reporting expiration results, which is the most common reason for public reports by an order of magnitude, your results must not be presented so as to unreasonably imply that potentially economic mineralization has been discovered. So in short, include relevant information such as exploration context, the type of method of sampling, relevant sample intervals and locations, distributions, dimensions and relative location of all relevant essay data, methods of analysis, data aggregation, uh, aggregation methods, land tenure status, plus whatever else could be relevant in this context. So of course, you don't want to be isolating the only good hit you got in your recent drilling and leave everything else out. That much seems pretty obvious. There are a couple of things I want to lift out and spotlight a little bit here. Um, you don't have to paste hundreds of pages of single line essay results and so on in your announcement. You just need to provide enough information so that a clear and balanced view on the mineralization can be obtained. That should really make it pretty clear what you should and shouldn't paste in your appendices. True width is hardly ever reported on in the body of the report. Yes, there is an allocation for this in table one, but clause 19 actually requires you to address this in the main body of the public report. 
Director specials are still being used every now and then to try and get a move in the share price or being vague about true widths. Following this, if you don't include images in your public report as well, it becomes difficult pretty quickly to put your expiration results in the right context. And yes, I have seen this being misused often to hide bad results. So when you are reporting expiration results, you have to include clear diagrams and maps designed to represent the geological context. They have to include, but not be limited to a planned view of drill hole collar locations and appropriate sectional views. Grade capping or data aggregation methods are also important. The problem that I have with this is that it's never discussed in the body of the report where the results are presented in the part that investors actually read. Table one, where you usually find some mandatory uh, sections on this, has missed its purpose and rather than a checklist to make sure that all these things are appropriately addressed in the report itself, they have become a dumping ground for copy-paste information that most people are way too lazy to take proper care of. So even though in table one there is usually a comment around grade capping, it's not always clear what has actually been done here. And there are still too many companies that are cleverly using uncapped grades to make it look that they have very wide intervals of mineralization. Clause 19 very clearly states that you have to discuss data aggregation methods in your report itself. Hardly any company actually does this properly. This practice is still far more prevalent on the Canadian markets, but every now and then I see one on the ASX, where it's dubious as to what has been done to represent the mineralization average grade down the hole, especially if clear diagrams are missing. So with regards to reporting expiration results on the JORT, if you get these things right in your public reports, you should be pretty good on the compliance side. Moving on to number three, reporting of expiration targets. With the reporting of expiration targets, things are pretty simple, but they don't often follow the rules. Just make sure you do the following to make sure you stay compliant. Number one, include a proximal statement that the potential quantity and grade is conceptual in nature that there has been insufficient exploration to estimate a mineral resource, and it is uncertain if further exploration will result in the estimation of a mineral resource. Number two, don't use the expiration target in a headline statement. Now for me, this also includes the headline bullet points, but admittedly, that's a bit of a gray area. Number three, you have to include proposed expiration activities to test the expiration target and the time frame to complete those activities. And lastly, use grade and tonnage ranges, ranges to reflect the lack of confidence. You then have to include a description of the process used to determine these ranges. So these are some really clear rules that are hard to take out of context or to in interpret freely. But I still see reports being announced where expiration targets are being presented in context as mineral resources. Next point, number four, discussion on reasonable prospects of eventual extraction. Clause 20 states that the basis for the reasonable pr prospects assumption is always a material matter and must be explicitly disclosed and discussed by the competent person within the public report. I find that this is hardly ever addressed with sufficient detail, if at all. The same clause also says the reasonable prospects disclosure must also include a discussion of the technical and economic support for the cutoff assumptions applied, which is another point that often isn't discussed. In fact, many reporting entities are in breach of the ASX listing rule 5.8.1, where it's stated that a summary of information material to understanding the reported estimates must be provided, including discussion of geology, sampling and subsampling, drilling techniques, classification criteria, sample analysis, estimation methodology, cutoff grades, and mining metallurgical parameters. So this stuff is also all part of table one, but as I explained ab above, and something that I will focus on in a separate video, the information in this table one is usually sparse and of poor quality, and it was never intended to function as a complete summary of all this work. All this information should be in the main body of the public announcement. 
I suggest you just include some standard lines to comply with the code if these are relevant, of course, to your case. For instance, when discussing classification of your resource, just state that in the competent person's view, it is a realistic inventory of the mineralization which, after preliminary evaluation of technical, economic and development conditions, might, in whole or in part, become economically extractable. In a competent person's opinion, it is more likely than not that there are reasonable prospects for eventual economic extraction of the such and such deposit. Portions of the deposit that do not have reason, reasonable prospects for eventual economic extraction are not included in the mineral resource. In classifying the resource, the competent person has regarded several aspects that affect resource confidence, and then you list them. Naturally, for a standard WA open pit or a genetic gold deposit, these comments will quite easily apply. But if you are reporting on a seabed nodule deposit, you will need to include quite specific information to satisfy the potentially economically extractable condition. So, include this statement and include enough detail to stay compliant, in particular with regards to clause 20. Moving on to number five, inappropriate rounding. Last year, a lot of complaints were received by the OSMEMS Complaints Committee, specifically with rounding on resource and reserve public announcements. This highlighted a bit of an issue with how the complaints process works or doesn't work at most of these don't always warrant a Spanish Inquisition, and a committee of volunteers is getting bogged down by a raft of seemingly trivial matters but more on that later as well. But what it does demonstrate is that too many resource estimation practitioners do not fully comprehend the intentions of the classification process, where it is important to convey to investors the lack of confidence in the estimate. Quite often, incorrect rounding goes together with misuse of wording, and instead of the word estimation, the word calculation is used. Have a look at clause 25 to read exactly why this is discouraged. By the way, you see this a lot in French language jurisdictions as the word estimate must not translate very well. So let's break this down a little bit further. If you classify something in inferred, then I'm using a rough rule of thumb that this means error bars of around 25 to 50%. Now, not all of that needs to sit in the estimation of tonnage. And quite often you may have a really good handle on the tons and not so much on the grade but let's just run with these numbers for the sake of the example. A single block in your average maiden gold resource may be in the order of 20 by 20 by two and a half meters or something similar. If you use an average density of three tons per cube, then each single block in your resource represents around 3000 tons. So if you round your inferred resource to the single ton, like this report here, for instance, then this really misrepresents the confidence that you have. Equally, grades cannot always be accurately determined to the two decimal places for gold, especially for those resources where a lot of historic core or poor sampling practices were used. With the rounding of inferred and indicated tons, I always try to work out for myself where the balance lies between my confidence in tons and confidence in grades, and then work out what that represents in my deposit. Have I extrapolated extensively for inferred? Are lines between drill holes tough to draw and do I have a poor handle on geological control? Are my density estimates questionable because of lack of data or bias in the density determination? Now, according to the code, this means that quite often you can only report an inferred mineral resource to only one significant figure. So for instance, 12 million something something tons that come out of your block report should be reported at 10 million tons. That doesn't seem right. In my view, it's probably more appropriate to report something like that as 12 million tons, all depending on the conditions I mentioned earlier, of course. Notice that according to the Wikipedia page on significant numbers, the significance of trailing zeros in a number not containing a decimal point can be ambiguous. Further ambiguity comes actually out of the word should used in clause 25. Notice that the code doesn't say must in this case. And in a recent case, a governing body has therefore ruled that incorrect rounding does actually not constitute a compliance breach. 
This seems a diversion from last year and the years before where the same governing body had upheld similar complaints of non-compliance on this issue made to it. Anyway, again, it all seems to be too trivial to leave sleep over, right? So when I discussed this the other day with a senior rep of the committee, we agreed that the main thing around the rounding is an apparent lack of appreciation of communication of uncertainty in the estimation process. And as I said earlier, it usually reveals other issues as well. So it's a go-to point for me to quickly get a feel for the general compliance and quality of the public report. So in summary, just use reasonable and appropriate rounding techniques in resource classifications. Common ground, in my opinion, is pretty easy to find in this space, and then we can all move on and focus on more important things. Moving on to point six, referring to previous results, quite often references made to a previous mineral resource estimate or expiration result. If there are no changes to those results, you don't need to include a full table one if you're not actually disclosing new material information, and a competent person statement may not be necessary. But what you must do is include a clear reference to the specific announcement in which the results were released. The relevant information is explained on page 42 of the code and in the ASX listing rules 5.23.2. It also includes a mandatory compliance statement that quite often is missing. The company confirms that it is not aware of any new information or data that materially affects the information included in the original market announcement and in the case of estimates of mineral resources or ore reserves that all material assumptions and technical parameters underpinning the estimates in the relevant market announcement continue to apply and have not materially changed. The company confirms that the form and context in which the competent person's findings are presented have not been materially modified from the original market announcement. So this is a very easy one and a quick win. Just include this statement as a nice footnote each time you refer to a previous estimate or expiration results. Number seven, technical studies masking as scoping studies. I'm not going to get into the detailed scoping studies in a minefield that some people associate ASX Guidance Note 31 and related discussions with. What I am going to highlight is the general confusion that surrounds the compliance with scoping studies and what you can do and what you can't do. The main theme is around the public statement of a production target or a financial forecast statement and your reasonable ground to make those statements. It has started to become more common for people to try and find ways around these requirements. For instance, by not invoking the term scoping study and by cleverly rewording some of the terms and in information and not discussing any financial forecast, some companies have been flying under the radar of the ASX. It seems that any two-day whittle pit optimization should somehow move the share price. And companies are keen to tell their shareholders the good news of these quick studies without having to jump through all these new scoping study hoops. They have to be careful though, as there have been some retractions on the market recently and reporting tons above a widow pitch shell is nothing short of a production target. If you are in the process of a scoping study or a feasibility study, but it's taking a long time, and in the meantime, you want to tell your shareholders that the increase of the mineral resource you just reported will improve the project economics by stating the tons that you now plan to process. You can't do this. If you state those tons, especially without the appropriate confidence language and use of ranges and so on, you need to discuss all the material assumptions and make all the correct compliance statements. So be very careful. The code is written for us to properly, transparently relay the risk and confidence in our statements. The November 2016 ASX interim guidance note states that it will take some time to develop an appropriate and robust framework for reporting of scoping studies. And I believe there are still some wrinkles to iron out. And a lot of our clients sometimes understandably feel hard done by. If you want to know whether you are compliant, download the November 2016 guidance note here and the guidance note 31 
and that should get you going. If you get stuck, get in touch with me. Number eight, competent person statements. Just let's just talk briefly about the competent person statement. First, it's only necessary for initial or materially changed expiration results, mineral resources, or ore reserves, which is clause number three. I see them thrown in willy-nilly in just about any half technical announcement, and I really wonder whether the competent persons who are quoted are actually aware of their names being used. Second, please just take the time to copy across the exact proper wording required from page 42 of the code. If you're only signing off on expiration results, you don't have to copy across the bit on mineral resources and ore reserves. Make sure you include your consent statement properly in the competent person statement. Last number, proper consenting process. Following this last point, just for the protection of you, the competent person, make sure you do not sign the consent form before you have cited the final version of the public announcement. And make sure you have a system in place where you agree in writing with the disclosing party that it is the actual version you will be consenting to. Too many times, and not uncommon in larger companies either, someone higher up the food chain will suddenly wonder why on earth they have to put all those pages of table one in there, and they delete it and the complaint will be against you, the competent person. So make also very much sure that the consent form is the appropriate one. Check it out on page 39 of the code. When it comes to the title of the report, you're consenting to be released. Note that this isn't the title of your full technical report, which we required on the JORG to be the documentation. It is the title of the public announcement that you need to fill out here. I've heard from people who have been put on the spot by their companies to sign off on things they don't feel comfortable with. It has destroyed the careers of several people I know, so be very careful here. Now, luckily, I haven't been in this situation myself, but I suggest to set this playing field very clearly at the beginning of your employment, whether this is as a consultant or as a permanent employee. I really feel for those who have been caught in this web and I hope there will be improvements to the system to protect you going forward. There you have it. Of course, there is so much more to decode its relationship with the ASX listing rules, its various stakeholders, its purpose, and so on. I'll try to explore these issues further in the months to come and we'll be posting videos on this and other things. If you have specific questions or topics, please email me and I'll have a look at it. For anyone who wants some help with these things like reporting compliance, RSC provides compliance review services that make sure that your reports are compliant. We also fix grammatical areas and structuring issues, and we can help with drafting. We usually do this in a matter of a few hours, so for the cost, you get an amazing outcome, and our track changes will help you get it right the next time. Let me know in the comments field below what you think, and thanks for listening and see you in the next video.